Well, welcome everybody to the October meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society and we are uh, still in the uh, sixth uh, lockdown in uh, Victoria, though uh, soon to uh, be ending uh, in a uh, few days time. Now for the uh, October meeting, uh, it's going to have a, a bit of a theme around uh, satellites <coughs> and uh, launches. Uh, this particular month uh, is actually an anniversary of uh, the launch of uh, Sputnik 1, which was the Russian spacecraft, the first artificial satellite put into uh, Earth orbit by uh, humanity, and uh, that was on the 4th of October 1957. And uh, it was pretty much uh, what uh, sparked the space race uh, from uh, then onwards, uh, prompting uh, America to uh, beat the Russians uh, eventually to uh, the moon. Now Sputnik itself uh, you'll actually see uh, on the next slide when we come to it, but uh, it was a, a sphere about uh, two feet uh, in diameter, so um, about 58 uh, centimetres, weighed about 84 kilograms, so uh, quite significant. And it was only up in orbit for a couple of months, and um, in fact its batteries only lasted a, a couple of weeks uh, in orbit uh, when it was uh, transmitting uh, radio signals. <coughs> Now, during, uh, during the month since uh, we last met, uh, Mars's uh, <coughs> Perseverance rover from uh, NASA has uh, taken successfully two uh, rock core samples, and uh, so far those uh, rock samples are uh, looking like uh, they've detected the presence of uh, salt below the surface, which indicates uh, water in the past, and hence that, uh, that indicates that the crater that uh, the, um, uh, the rover is in may indeed have had uh, sustainable levels of uh, water in, um, in the past in geological time spans, which was uh, all good news. Also, uh, on a uh, lighter note, we've had a couple of launches um, of uh, a more commercial nature. Uh, Space, uh, SpaceX launched the uh, Four Inspiration mission, which effectively was putting four civilians into space, so uh, no um, uh, formal pilots were actually on board this, uh, this one. Uh, it was launched from the Kennedy uh, Space Center in uh, the USA and included a CEO, um, a medical officer, a data engineer and uh, a geoscientist uh, basically going up for a three-day uh, jaunt. They went as high as um, 575 kilometres, which means uh, uh, when they're up uh, at that level, it's uh, further away than the International Space Station and indeed uh, even the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And after three days, they uh, came back and uh, splashed down on Earth. And you can actually see the, uh, the launch on the first slide there. And um, it's not actually showing the uh, the parachute landing uh, three days later, but um, quite uh, quite a ride for uh, their money. Uh, over on the right there in South Australia, a uh, launch was uh, attempted during the month uh, on uh, the 16th um, uh, at uh, Whalers Way, which is near Port Lincoln in uh, South Australia. Um, they uh, had to abort uh, the the launch of this uh, Taiwanese uh, rocket. Um, twice and on the uh, third attempt it actually uh, caught fire on the launch pad and uh, that sort of um, pulled the rug out of, uh, of that uh, launch at least uh, in the near uh, future uh, but maybe later this year. And the next one was uh, Blue Origin uh, launched its uh, next uh, craft up to the, uh, the Kármán line which is uh, 100 uh, kilometres arbitrarily chosen uh, above uh, the Earth's surface and this time they had uh, the actor William Shatner on board from uh, Star Trek fame, 90 year old uh, at, uh, this, uh, at this stage and um, uh, unknown how much uh, was actually paid uh, to get that seat on the flight but uh, it went up uh, for just about a 10 minute uh, flight from launch to uh, landing down, got up to uh, the uh, Kármán line after its uh, launch um, from their facilities in uh, West Texas. Uh, on board also was uh, an uh, Australian uh, ex-NASA engineer, uh, Dr. Chris uh, uh, Boshujan, I think I've got the uh, the pronunciation of that right and uh, I believe he actually uh, pestered uh, Jeff Bezos quite a bit to uh, get that uh, seat on the flight and uh, obviously it paid off uh, in the end albeit for only 10 minutes and of course unsure how much uh, it actually uh, costed him. Now down in the, uh, the bottom right hand side of the screen also launched during uh, the month was the NASA's uh, Lucy mission. Um, Lucy is actually named after the famous uh, hominid 
uh, fossil that uh, was found many years ago and in this particular one they're going off to look at uh, some of the uh, fossil relics of the early solar system prior to planetary formation um, where those relics have actually been trapped in uh, Jupiter's orbit uh, in um, special orbits uh, around uh, Jupiter and uh, you can see uh, the orbits of these uh, so-called Trojan uh, asteroids uh, down in the uh, the bottom uh, right hand side and how they mirror and follow uh, Jupiter around uh, in its orbit in, um, ge uh, in stable um, positions over astronomical uh, time spans. Now NASA launched it on uh, the 16th of uh, October uh, successfully. It's a 12 year mission out to uh, the Trojan asteroids and it doesn't go there uh, initially. It uh, does uh, a couple of Earth uh, flybys grabbing some energy from Earth in its orbit. So in other words, uh, slowing Earth down just by that tiny bit each time it uh, comes by and uh, robs a bit of kinetic energy from the Earth, but uses it to uh, fling itself off uh, very, very quickly uh, in space. Indeed, at the moment, it's traveling, I think, over 100,000 kilometers an hour anyway uh, in that um, uh, an initial phase of trying to actually uh, get to uh, the Trojan uh, asteroids. Unfortunately, it uh, suffered uh, a bit of a, uh, a hiccup with uh, not being able to properly unfurl some of its uh, solar panels. They're very, very large arrays of solar panels being uh, about the uh, equivalent size of a five-story building. Um, so uh, quite, um, <clears throat> quite a large uh, diameter and uh, fortunately enough is actually there to be producing uh, useful amounts of uh, light at least uh, in earth orbit uh, um, location um, but by, by of course by the time it gets out to jupiter uh, the uh, the sun is uh, not much more than just a very bright star in the uh, sky for it um, also, uh, there were plans uh, submitted uh, to the uh, in International uh, uh, Telecommunications Union for putting a, um, a constellation of uh, 327,000 satellites uh, being put forward by an Arwandan company called um, Marvel Space. And uh, if you think the, uh, the Spacelink uh, satellites that we have in orbit at the moment, which uh, number in the thousands, um, are something to worry about. Just imagine what uh, 327,000 of them in low Earth orbit uh, are going to be for internet and uh, communications purposes. China last year, for example, put forward a proposal to put 13,000 low Earth orbit uh, satellites up uh, as well in the near future but uh, even that is uh, pretty small in comparison to uh, 327,000. So uh, not sure yet uh, whether or not that's effectively gonna crowd out the sky and potentially cause major issues to uh, even um, having manned launches going up uh, safely. And of course, during the month we saw um, uh, from uh, earlier in the uh, year, the uh, Las Palmas uh, volcano erupting on the Canary Islands where there's quite a substantial professional telescope uh, elsewhere on the island and we'll see some of that in uh, a later video uh, later on uh, today. So we'll first of all look at uh, uh, events uh, in the past month, uh, past and, uh, and upcoming ones as well as best uh, we know given the uh, COVID uh, lockdown situation and uh, the level of vaccination that uh, is rapidly increasing. Then um, came across a, uh, a, a very little known and uh, almost lost uh, documentary from the 1980s all about uh, Sputnik and how a, a UK, a UK uh, teacher um, actually uh, instructed his class uh, in how to uh, monitor it with um, amateur ham radio and in fact uh, for many decades they were following uh, launches from uh, the uh, USSR and uh, also from China of um, uh, not only regular satellites but their spy satellites as well characterizing them finding out where they were actually launched by listening into the coded uh, signals by decoding them and this is uh, the uh, the story of, uh, of the teacher Mr Perry who passed away unfortunately in uh, 2000 and um, they, uh, they kept doing that for uh, generations of uh, students at uh, that particular school, well known in the uh, space industry. 
Following that, there'll be Sky for the Month by uh, Mark uh, Stevens, and maybe next month uh, we may even have uh, it live at uh, the Briars, fingers crossed. And after that, uh, we go into uh, a few um, science-related uh, videos. One um, is all about how we actually uh, have shown that the Earth does rotate, and uh, a little bit about what's known as the uh, Foucault uh, pendulum. If uh, any of you have actually uh, seen one of these, it's quite a, a fascinating uh, thing to watch over a period of time as it uh, slowly rotates, uh, as the Earth rotates uh, underneath it. Following that, uh, and as promised in last month's meeting, where we showed the black hole observations at the centre of the Milky Way uh, galaxy, our galaxy, by the Very Large uh, Telescope in uh, Chile, uh, this is actually showing you how they recoat the mirror that's inside the Very Large uh, Telescope. So these are massive several metres uh, diameter uh, instruments, and it's not just one instrument, I think there's four at least there, um, that uh, occasionally they have to take out and um, re-coat again, uh, just to uh, keep up uh, the sensitivity to uh, light levels. And then finally about the uh, Canary Islands um, volcano, and a uh, little bit of explanation here by um, uh, Dr Becky Smethers from uh, University of Oxford. We've seen her in some past uh, videos that we've shown in uh, earlier meetings. And she was actually due to be observing with her uh, PhD students um, actually on the uh, Las Palmas uh, telescope and uh, had her uh, trip uh, cancelled at the very last moment. She explains why they need to do that and why um, a volcanic ash is just not good for uh, any sort of uh, observatory or uh, telescopes at all. And some of the ways are actually, um, so some of the impacts are actually quite uh, surprising. You might not uh, obviously uh, think of it. Um, shown in the background of this slide also is um, uh, the uh, replica of the actual Sputnik. This was like a, a second one that was built uh, actually at uh, the time. And you can see the four radio antennas coming off it that uh, transmitted uh, down to Earth. So uh, recent uh, events uh, during the last month, we had to cancel the barbecue, obviously, because we were all in uh, lockdown. <clears throat> committee uh, meeting went ahead by uh, Zoom and we obviously discussed uh, what would happen with uh, the various scenarios of uh, reopening. We uh, finalised the meteorite competition and the prizes have now been sent out to uh, the five lucky winners uh, in Australia. Um, as it turns out of uh, all the entries, uh, all five happen to uh, be in Victoria and uh, one indeed was uh, very local and he even listened in to uh, Trevor's uh, talk about uh, shooting stars, which uh, inspired him to um, answer the competition, it turns out. We also uh, finalised the order for the uh, excellent almanacs for 2022, showing you everything that's in the night sky, so-called uh, Astronomy 2022. And uh, these are available to purchase uh, with uh, the Society's uh, discount, and uh, while well, stocks last, and these will be available um, most probably this weekend at the Briars, uh, assuming of course that uh, we're allowed to have uh, some sort of gathering there as, uh, as planned based on the trajectory of uh, vaccinations in Victoria. Um, also during the month there was the Victorian Astronomy Convention which uh, had to contend with uh, lockdown even though it was in uh, regional Victoria so they um, switched and pivoted quite quickly to doing everything online uh, via Zoom. Um, I unfortunately wasn't able to, due to work, uh, be able to uh, listen in to any of those. Um, but I do know so several members actually did listen in uh, remotely to the uh, astronomy talks that were given uh, remotely by Zoom by our friends up at the uh, Ballarat Observatory. Uh, and on the 15th of October we had to cancel the scout night, obviously because of uh, the uh, COVID uh, lockdown and uh, so they, they will probably ask uh, sometime next year for us to, uh, to give them a, a viewing night at the Bryant. So coming up soon, assuming we're all uh, out of lockdown, uh, this Saturday, uh, fingers crossed, we should have the uh, observatory uh, reopened for members uh, within whatever restrictions are in uh, place. Uh, most likely it's going to be uh, an entirely outside event. I think uh, from when I looked at the roadmap uh, a week or two ago, when it was first released, they were indicating it would probably be up to 
50 people uh, in an outdoor setting with uh, density limits of one person per uh, four square meters. And if that's the case, there'll be a simple um, bunning style barbecue uh, actually this uh, Saturday. So keep an eye out uh, for any email postings on the eScorpius group uh, for that. Next committee meeting will be the following Wednesday on the 27th. And uh, on the 29th, we were going to have our quarterly uh, SCAG night for Scouts, Cubs and Guides. And alas, that uh, is uh, cancelled for this year uh, um, again, uh, because we're focusing on members for the remainder of the year and uh, then getting back to engagement with the uh, public schools and that uh, in the new year in 2022. On the 5th of November, assuming that uh, we are uh, open uh, sufficiently, which uh, I very su suspect that we've, we will be, um, Manfred Berger will be uh, giving his planned talk uh, instead of to a public viewing night, uh, it will be a members only viewing night at the same time as we would normally do a monthly public viewing night. Uh, being 8pm 8, 8 on the first Friday uh, of the month and uh, he's working on the, uh, the the talk for that one. Next meeting at the Briars on the 17th of November we anticipate, uh, fingers crossed, will be face to face. We're not sure how many people will actually be allowed uh, indoors but um, hopefully uh, there'll be, uh, um, we'll be back to at least being able to have 20 inside if not um, uh, more optimistically maybe 50. Uh, on the 20th of November, we'll uh, have a, uh, a Members Telescope Learning Day, the so-called TLD. It was originally planned for the 24th of October, but that wasn't going to fly uh, because of um, the, uh, the lockdown uncertainties around it. Normally, the Telescope Learning Day is open not only to members, but also the general public as well. But uh, this year, it will just be for uh, members. And of course, the members will uh, need to be uh, doubly vaccinated as well to be able to uh, be on site and to QR code check in as well. Um, the telescope learning day means you can bring your own telescopes uh, if you wish, or just uh, learn from one of the telescopes that is actually on the site. And there'll be um, various members uh, either giving talks about uh, the basics of telescopes, or, or indeed they'll show you how to use uh, your telescopes uh, to uh, the best uh, possible. On the 3rd of December, which is the normal um, public night uh, at the Briars for December, instead of being a public night, again, it will be a members only night and uh, Trevor Hand will give uh, a talk there on a subject uh, yet to be um, uh, nailed down. And that will be 8 p.m. on the first Friday of uh, December. Now we were having uh, the Shires Christmas Festival, at least it was pencilled in for the 10th of December, but uh, that's well and truly been um, COVID uh, cancelled uh, amongst uh, other reasons. Now the Society Dinner, assuming that uh, we're allowed, able to have at least uh, 20 uh, people present, and indeed um, hopefully uh, it's going to be indoors, otherwise it might be a, a little bit cooler outdoors. On the 11th of December, which is a Saturday, will be the annual Christmas dinner. In past years, we've typically had uh, roast dinners uh, catered and brought into the society. So uh, because we need to be uh, pretty sure of the amount of food to, uh, to buy, um, bookings are actually essential. And the link for that will be sent round um, on eScorpius. Um, so uh, people can uh, book uh, themselves in, at least members can book themselves in for that, provided that they're uh, doubly vaccinated. Unfortunately, if you're not doubly vaccinated, then you'll have to wait until either the government changes the rules a little bit, um, or uh, alternatively, they throw up their hands and give up and say it's everywhere. And so there's no need to uh, have restrictions um, in uh, community service uh, facilities. The, uh, the Christmas dinner, uh, incidentally, uh, is usually free for members, uh, but there's a $5 booking fee that is uh, per head, which is refunded um, if you actually turn up on the night. And the idea of that is to dissuade uh, people from uh, not turning up at the, uh, the last moment. So tonight's uh, feature, instead of being a, a talk or a lecturer, is this um, almost lost documentary from uh, 1987 about uh, Sputnik's beeps and Mr. Perry. And um, you can uh, get to um, know the uh, background story about how they detected Sputnik with very, very basic uh, equipment and some good uh, know-how and how they managed to inspire a, a more than one generation to actually continue following satellite launches 
um, that uh, were being put up by uh, the Russians and Chinese. I'm not sure if they've actually, uh, whether they did for other uh, countries as well. In 1958, teacher Geoffrey Perry thought of a way of making his science lessons more interesting for his boys. He ended up by discovering one of Russia's most closely guarded space secrets. This is the story of how he and his pupils at Kettering Grammar School did it. In the summer of 58, when young David and Mike Sinnett moved to Kettering, little did they know what adventures their new neighbour had in store for them. The first impressions when I saw Mr. Perry out of the window, I think it was, was that he was uh, quite a frightening character. He was uh, quite a big character, and I thought, uh, you know, I don't know whether I'm going to get on with him or not, really. Well, this is kind. I know what it's like. You must be exhausted. Don't touch, David. Is your husband going to join us? I don't know. I'd better not interrupt him. I'm not sure what he's doing. He was going to take Izzy's picture, but it's nearly her bedtime now. Oh, there you are. Well, where's the camera? Ah, uh, it's upstairs. I fastened it to the bedroom window. <gasps> David? I was just wondering what that is. What's it look like? Don't know. Will your watch tell the time in the dark? Yes, why? Right. Geiger counter. That's right. He's always been interested in scientific things, haven't you, David? Oh, what sort of things? Oh, like watching beetles and tadpoles. And... Oh, that. That is science, isn't it? Well, up to a point, yes. Please, what is this powder stuff? Oh, powder stuff? Now, watch this closely. Grammar school here. Yeah. So if they pass the eleven plus, well, it might be um, quite difficult when they're just It's moving. Oh, wow. A magnet. I believe your husband teaches there. Is that right? Yes, he teaches. For it must be iron. That's right, iron filings. So you will probably be teaching them. They get it managed to get. Oh. Yes. So. When will you take Izzy's picture? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. It'll have to be in the morning now. I want to take a time exposure of the Sputnik. The Sputnik? Why haven't you seen it yet? Well, it was Mr. Perry that took us into the back garden and got us interested in looking at stars and at satellites and things going around the Earth, which, uh, to me, I'd, I've got no idea what they were or didn't exist to me before, before moving to Kettering, certainly. I'd always been interested in the idea of space and space travel. And from the time a V2 dropped near my home in Essex in 1944, it was clear that it would not be long before we had satellites in orbit. What began as a general scientific interest in space gradually became an educational program supporting my physics teaching. It would then become an overriding passion dictating our whole lives, meals, holidays, sleep, getting up, all dictated by satellite passes over Kettering.
And in 1958, Derek Slater came as our new chemistry master. He happened to be a radio amateur, G3FOZ. And I realized that here was someone with the means to allow me to listen to the things which I've been looking at. Can I help you? Uh, well, yes, maybe you can. I've got a problem. Technical? Yes. Conversion job. Uh, what? Sorry, but uh, a lot of people wanting their TV sets converted to get ITV as well. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's hear it then. Well, last year at the Science Masters do, this chap played a tape recording of Sputnik 1. Yes. Well, it struck me as a very fine example of the Doppler effect. You know, to use in class, instead of the usual guff about trains. You know, the sound drops an octave. Well, that was eight months ago. He promised to send me a copy, but he never did. Drop him a line. No, no, I don't ask people twice. I'm going to take the next Sputnik myself. So what's the snag? I don't know how to do it. Shouldn't be too difficult. Shouldn't it? Well, the Sputniks go over this part of the country, don't they? If I could speak to somebody in the Balkans, there's a fair chance I could record a Sputnik. <laughs> Worth trying, anyway. <laughs> what on earth do you find to say to someone in the Balkans? <laughs> You're missing the point. The thing is, just sitting there with a, a couple of valves, a battery and a Morse key, you've made your own gear out of second-hand junk, the bloke at the other end's done the same. All right, they're all crazy, but there's a great spirit there, anyway. Uh, what would I need to make that tape? Well, a decent receiver. And what will that cost? A few hundred quid. Oh. But uh, I've got one. I, you've got one? Marconi CR100. Got it for 25. And uh, a tape recorder. Well, I've got one of those. And a signals generator. They don't come cheap. You don't happen to have one, do you? No. But, uh... I know someone who could lend me one. Like I said, they're nice people. They like helping each other. When do you want it, Bart? When it goes up, it might be any time now. Oi. I think he took it pretty well as a matter of course. He had great faith in the radio that uh, if the thing was there and transmitting, then we would certainly hear it. I suppose it started when I was a teenager in the war years in the Lake District with an interest in explosives and firearms, uh, raiding crashed aircraft on the Coniston Hills, finding bits and pieces. And uh, say, when we couldn't find any ammunition, we'd fill our rucksacks with uh, broken up radio gear. And uh, the natural thing when we had it was to take it to bits, see if we'd find out how it worked, see if we could use the parts for something else. So, building radio equipment from that. Derek and I are quite different. He's good on the technical side. I like the orbits, the calculation. He was a last minute man. Uh, school reports were done at the last minute. You waited for your chemistry marks always. But you got them, they were done. Derek's attitude was that if there was a deadline, you met the deadline. You didn't sort of get them in three weeks ahead. Ah, Mr. Slater. Read the end of term reports. I haven't yet received Form 3's chemistry marks. Sorry. You seem to find that comment very amusing, Miller. What did you say to him? Sir, call him a Martian. Oh, really? Sir, we can tune into space. We're going to help Mr. Pay listen to the Sputnik. 3A, isn't it? Here we are. Sir. Young Miller. Seems to have visions of communicating with little green men. <laughs> now that I haven't promised. We may get some brown men. I got Tunis last week. Off you go then. Oh, Mr. Perry, I, I don't know whether you gathered, but um, he has rather individual teaching methods. He tends to rely upon what I once heard described as the gee whiz factor. Why not, if he gets them interested? Well, there is a danger of raising expectations. Young boys get disillusioned very quickly. 
a word of caution. Don't let yourself get carried away. Hmm? This Sputnik idea, for instance. Sounds a bit far-fetched. It's worth trying. And it'll work. Well. <laughs> yeah, see what I mean. In these early days, we were really stumbling, feeling our way. There wasn't much written about it. We had to find out what we could from where we could. Sputnik 4 was launched at midnight on the 15th of May. And I heard about it that Sunday morning on the BBC Radio News. I thought, this is what we've been waiting for. So during the morning, I cycled up to Derek's and said, we've got a new Sputnik up. How about having a go for it tomorrow morning? What time tomorrow morning? Uh, 4.15. In the morning? That seems to be the best chance of hearing it. Well, we'll need an oscillator. I'll have to get in touch with Cyril. GCI 3K, Cyril Dobson. I'll go and see him after tea. That seems to be leaving it a bit late. Jeff, I'll get it. I'll get it. set the alarm for about quarter to four, got up, pulled a pair of trousers and pull over on over the pyjamas on the bike along Windmill Avenue to the lab. As I cycled to the school, I thought, will Derek be there? Is there too much moonlight? Shall we see it? Will it transmit? I suppose getting up at uh, four in the morning to listen to radio signals isn't everybody's idea of a normal occupation, but it seemed quite logical to us at the time to do this. I'd become accustomed to making visual observations of satellites, looking at them as they went like slowly moving stars across the sky. Would I see it tonight?
Just what makes that little old ant Think he'll move that rubber tree plant Anyone knows an ant can't Move a rubber tree plant But he's got high hopes He's got high hopes He's got high apple pie in the sky Hope so anytime you're getting Low stead of letting go, just remember that ant. Oops, there goes another rubber tree plant. Oops, there goes another rubber tree plant. Oops, there goes another rubber tree plant. So I can remember the, the picnics very well. Uh, we all used to pile into the car and uh, there was a great excitement about getting into the car because we didn't have a car at the time and just going for a ride was exciting enough. And we'd have a, a nice picnic when we got there and Mr Perry would play ball games with us, usually football or cricket. We'd be sitting there talking and suddenly he's gone. He's off listening to bleeps. If we go away he's got a receiver in the caravan with him. He's got books full of figures of every satellite that's ever been launched. What's it for? Well, at first it was to interest the boys. It does that all right. Mine are always on about it. But Jeff and Derek Slater, it's as if they feel something's going to happen. They've even got me thinking something's going to happen. Though I can't imagine what. The game of cricket was exciting enough. Uh, in fact, we were there, all, all of us playing cricket. But Mr Perry would uh, go to great lengths to explain how the whole idea of seam bowling is to use the friction of the ball as it passes through the air. And the, the bowlers would polish one side of the ball to make it slip through the air faster than the other side. And therefore, it would swerve in the air as, as they delivered the ball. Tea time! And I'd never understood why these bowlers polished the ball on their trousers so vigorously before. Jeff? Oh, I got Thank you. You know, Jeff, if you were to tell me the times of the orbits, I could put lunch on a bit earlier or a bit later instead of keeping things warm. Much better still, I could stay at school for lunch. I'll be on the spot then, all right? Yes, all right. What? No ham? We first started involving pupils in the observations with the girls that came from Kettering High School to do physics and chemistry. They had nowhere to go in their spare time because they only took three A levels instead of four. You heard that new song? What, by Susan Moore? Oh, what song's that? Bobby's Girl. I know all the words. Well, go on then, give us a song. Hello. Come on. I wanna be boom, boom. Bobby's Girl. I wanna be boom, boom. Girl, that's the most important thing to me. And if I was Bobby's girl, why are you here? Sir, we're waiting for chemistry second lesson. We don't take practical maths. Yes, yes, I'm well aware of that. But why are you in the cloakroom? Well, they haven't told us anywhere else we can go, and it's raining out there. Well, you had better come and wait in the physics lab. And another day when they were sitting there sort of doing their work, I said to them, if that thing starts to make a noise, just note the time by the clock. So the first pupils to do observations were really girls from Kettering High School. And over the period up until about 1963, all the pupil observations were done by these girls. When the girls were no longer available, I still needed some slave labour to make the routine observations. And so I invited selected pupils to help me with the hobby. And that was the origin of a satellite group. The logging of all the data was not really all that hard. It was just a, uh, just a lot of facts and figures to be recorded. Mr. Perry made this interesting. It could have been very tedious, but it was Mr. Perry brought home to us the, 
the necessity of recording vast amounts of data in any scientific experiment. There's a lot of data to be recorded before you can make any interpretation of that data. Well, they certainly were uh, a cheap form of labour and they were able to fill in gaps when you weren't there. They unconsciously absorbed your technique. They, 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 they were learning without knowing that they were learning and this is the way in which one should learn. If you say to a lad, come on lad, I'll teach you something, he'll rebel, particularly in his dinner hour. When's it due, sir? In a minute or two. Sir, how do we know if there are men in it? <sighs> that bleeps fairy. Oh. George, I think he's got it. I don't know why he keeps hanging around. He's not very bright. And you only like the bright ones. Oh, don't we all? It's such a pain, the other kind. Sir, have the Russians announced it yet? No, it's not been on the news yet. They always wait for at least one orbit. Mm. Oh, no, oh, Wait, can they show you to come? Look, wait for Sir, will we hear the men talking? Yes, with any luck. If we don't, I'm going to kill myself. I've sweated blood over this. From 1963 onwards, we concentrated on satellites in the Cosmos program, which disappeared from Earth after eight days, even though they were still high enough to stay there for a bit longer. They were obviously being brought back to Earth on purpose. They were ideal for our purposes. They took 90 minutes to go around, so we were bound to catch one pass inside our dinner hours. And also, eight days was long enough for a single project, and it gave us a bit of time in between to get our breath back before they launched the next one. We in the group knew that they were obviously bringing these satellites down early for a particular purpose, but from the vast amounts of data that we were collecting, we knew there must be some information in there somewhere, but we didn't know why or what. Ken Owen of Flight International asked me what experiment I would want to do that took exactly eight days, and I would want to do it time and time again throughout the year, 10, 20 times. So I thought perhaps I'd better find out where these satellites were going. This loop of copper wire represents a satellite orbit. And this globe of my daughter's, which we used at the time for demonstration purposes, is the Earth. Now we clip the orbit on, 65 degrees in the northern hemisphere, and check that it's 65 degrees in the southern hemisphere. And the satellite in its orbit goes round and round while the Earth spins underneath it. 
The satellite is travelling from south to north during the daytime and from north to south during the night. Mr Perry had shown that the orbits of these satellites would take them over the United States during daylight hours. What we couldn't work out was to why it was important that the satellite should be over there during the sunlight time. On the pass here, going up the east coast of the United States, in 90 minutes the Earth turns approximately 22 and a half degrees, so the next pass is somewhat to the west. And the pass after that, up the west coast of the United States. Now because the Earth bends and bulges at the equator, the orbit also slowly rotates around the Earth's axis. So that on a given day, if this pass is for, say, Monday, then on Tuesday it will be a little bit more to the west, Wednesday a little bit more, Thursday and so on, until on the following Monday it's going exactly where it went the previous Monday on the following orbit. So in the space of eight days, the satellite has covered the whole of the United States and any other part of the Earth completely so that it's got complete coverage. We'd always been aware that satellites were used for recording weather information and mundane things like that, but here was a particular group of satellites that were covering every inch of the United States during daylight hours, and therefore they must be recording some particular information about the United States. Now another thing about these satellites was the fact that we were picking up signals on the eighth day as they came down on their parachutes over Kazakhstan. In order to get these recovery beacons, I noticed that I was going along the avenue later in the summer than I was in the winter. That seems strange. People tend to do things earlier in the summer than they do in the winter. Mr Perry asked us the question, what comes later in summer than it does in winter? And after much thought, we came up with sunset. Therefore, these missions are dependent upon the position of the sun in the sky, the angle of the sun. That affects the shadows on the ground. Now, shadows produce contrast in tall buildings. Therefore, reconnaissance. These things were spying. But what the Americans are mainly interested in when something is launched is whether it's a satellite or a missile. In. Well, everything. I mean, every single little thing about them. <laughs> Can you tell us, do you get any financial assistance in providing apparatus for this research? No. Well, wouldn't it help to have more up-to-date apparatus? I mean, when I were at the grammar school, I understood they had some sort of fund for helping with education equipment. Couldn't you, Mr. Slater, apply for that? We did. Once. Mr. Perry? Oh, Ron Smith. Oh, hi. In the manned satellites, are the voices transmitted on the same frequency as the bleeps? Well, yes, they used to be, but nowadays it's starting to get a bit more complicated. They've introduced this frequency shift keying, which is now not even regular, so what we get here is uh, only part of the Doppler curve. Slater may be working on a shoestring, but he's very good at making sure that all the signals are there. No, the bottleneck's with me. What I need is a whole team of mathematicians ready to process all those figures. I was very interested in your talk. Ah, so you teach physics? <laughs> no, no. I'm a computer programmer. Are you? Who for? Co-op corset factory. Corset factory. Yeah. Hey, listen, about this computer. It's an Elliot 803. It's a beautiful thing. It's just sitting there, eating its head off, you could say, because it's underused. You know what I mean? If you wanted to send me a set of those numbers in the morning, then I'd have them all processed and ready for you by the same evening. Take you months on a calculator. If you're interested, here's my number. Thank you. Don't mention it. This was just what I wanted. Thank you.
Thank you very much. The space program was growing and this enabled us to grow with it. It wasn't so much that the computer saved us time, it's that in that time that we say we were able to do more things and look at more satellites. Without a computer, we would have been left behind. In October 1964, there was a story on the front page of the Daily Telegraph, man's Soviet space shot expected soon. So that morning during physics practical, we tuned the radio to 19.995 megahertz, which was the frequency for Russian manned spacecraft. Right, run and get me Mr. Sato, will you? That sound to you like Vostok. Sounds like Vostok. I don't think it is Vostok. No, no, it's not, is it? You going to tell Swell? No, I will finish the lesson first. Oh, all right, all right, quieten down. Now you've got 15 minutes to finish that experiment. But, sir. All right, all right, now. How far have you got? We waited until 25 past 10, morning break, went over to the school office and phoned the radio and space research station at Slough. This was the place to where all satellite observations were sent. That's right, it's Perry from the boys' school in Kettering. I'm reporting signals on a new manned spacecraft received here at 10.15 a.m. on 19.995 megacycles. The signal was lost at... What? No, 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 no. I thought you might not be aware. That's why I'm phoning you. No, no, I know what Electron 1 sounds like. And besides, Electron 1 has never transmitted from that frequency. What? Cosmos 46? This man's a complete moron. 46 was brought down a week ago. So I put the phone down, especially as I was paying. I hadn't got out of the office when the phone went. Hello, Kettering Grammar School. Yes, will you hold a moment? Mr. Perry, it's for you. Oh. The Kettering Evening Telegraph. Thank you. Hello? Oh, Dick, hello, yes. Oh, good, good, they've announced it. Triple man. Oh, yes, yes, I knew all about it. I've just phoned Slow, but they had some clot on the other end. No, no, I will not ring them back. I soon found out that I was right. Here was the professional amateur conflict. If they were unaware of it, it didn't exist. But we knew. We'd heard it. It was even better the following day when the Daily Telegraph reported that George Bank, the University of Manchester's radio astronomy place, which had done all the early work on spacecraft, they'd failed to get voices. And we'd had actually had voices uh, four and a half hours after our first signals, where Komarov was saying, um, well, Ya Rubin, Kaxlisishaminya Prayom, I am Ruby, his call sign. How do you hear me? Over. There's no point in putting spacecraft into orbit if you can't get information back from them. And the science of getting this back is called telemetry, measurement at a distance. So all these bleeps that we've been listening to contains information. Some of these from things like the Soyuz, the manned spacecraft, Sputnik 4, you heard it go brrrr. That tells the people on the ground where to start measuring from. It's a synchronization pulse and tells you the beginning of what we call a frame. Each frame contains so many words. So you heard it go brrrr, beep, beep, Beep. Obviously there we've got some long ones and some short ones. The long ones are high values, the short ones are low values. So by measuring the lengths of these bleeps, we can get an idea of the value being transmitted. Still doesn't tell us what those values are. There was another class of satellite, transmitted groups of Morse code characters, uh, dashes and dots, sort of beep, 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 beep. 
And we found that there were 12 groups of three letters. And when you added up the dots and the dashes in each of these, you had seven. Uh, three dots and four dashes or things like that. And it seemed to me that um, we ought to be able to work out what these bleeps meant. S D T D D D S. This isn't Morse at all. Not even in Russian. Look, not even a single vowel. Unless it's coded Russian. Would they go that far? Maybe it isn't meant to be words. Well, I've been thinking that. Might be figures. I've had the boys convert them into binary. What do they mean? Two, three. What the Russians are doing? What? Shush, hold. Hold on a minute. What the Russians are doing, they're sending these figures down back to front. They're turning them around. Oh, yes. Why are they doing that? Well, I don't think it's to fool anybody. I think it's in case of signal phase. If that happened, they would certainly rather lose the smallest value than the largest. Good physics? See? What? So we got the numbers. But what do these numbers mean? Obviously, something was being used up through the flight. What could be used up? Well, we always thought that these satellites were spy satellites taking photographs of areas of interest underneath. And one obvious thing that could be used up was film. The other thing would be the gas which was used to stabilise the attitude of the spacecraft to make sure that it was always pointing down and steady. And then fortunately for us, there was a war and the Russians flew two satellites for five day missions instead of the usual eight. And they used this consumable over the five days totally of course, they wouldn't have needed to have used all the gas in five days. They'd only used half of it. As they'd used it all, it was obviously film. And so what we were really looking at in Word 7 was the exposure counter on their camera. of March 1966 we picked up signals which I said were unusual very weak amid much noise and when the Russians announced the orbit it had a different inclination from anything they'd launched before 72 degrees so obviously here was something quite new and it didn't take us long to realize by drawing a line on a map that this launch had gone from nowhere near the usual launch site beside the RLC. We didn't know where it was. Uh, the line ran from Italy up through to the island called Novaya Zimlia, up in the Arctic. So from somewhere along there, the Russians had launched this satellite. We wrote a letter to Flight International saying the Soviet Union is using a new launch site, its third launch site. But we had no idea where it was at that time. We just knew it must have come from somewhere different. Uh, that an article I think we, we published, or Mr Perry published at the time, um, and there's very little world reaction to that, and I suppose we felt a little bit disappointed that we'd highlighted something and no one really seemed to be interested. Mike! 
sorry. Oh, just a minute. Oh, no. There's been another Russian launch. This might be the one, and I'm not there. Not where? In Kettering. Look, see, we know the sights on this line. Now, sooner or later, they're going to send one up in a different orbit, see? Then we'll know where they cross, and we'll be able to tell the world there's the new launch site. Well, they can manage without you for once. Mr Perry will find someone else willing to help him. Oh, willing to, yeah. I know it doesn't give their eye teeth for the chance. Oh. It went up yesterday. He might have had an answer by now. Have you seen a phone box around here anywhere? There were two more launches during the summer at very similar inclinations, so that we couldn't really see where the three lines on the Atlas crossed. But then in October, we had another launch, Cosmos 129. Looks as though it's been on five, sir. That's why I got it cheap. It's a receiver from a burnt-out minicab. It's all right, though. It's only damaged on the outside. So what are you making, then, sir? Well, if this works, we'll be able to set it to switch on and record at any given time. Say I was having to get up at some unearthly hour in the morning. Three times. 22 is 67. Shut up a minute! Got it. Look here. I've got the second line. I've got the second line. Look, what's happened is this. I've been three out in the number of orbits for one, two, nine. It wasn't launched from anywhere on this line. We've got to move it 67 degrees north. That brings it to there, and that intersects with the line on one, one, two. So there's a new launching site. It's due south of Archangel. Do you mean to say that nobody else knows about this, apart from the Russians? Well, I won't claim that no one else knows. I'd be pretty surprised if we were the only ones, though. But if they do know, they've been very quiet about it. Have we got another scoop? I think you could say this is a big one. Hey, Jeff. Should we ring the newspapers? Hold on, hold on. What we've got here is a very elegant piece of research. And as scientists, we must follow the correct procedure. Right. I will announce it at the British Interplanetary Society early next month. But what if somebody else gets in first? No, no, there's no danger of that. Next, I will write a letter to Flight International and wait for the balloon to go up. Will it be on television? Well, I should think they'd recognise a good story when they see one. To be in the group at that time was very special to me because I was one of the, the few boys in the school who was actually working in the group. And it was something exciting. No one else was doing it. And uh, while they were all out playing football or playing cricket or whatever, we were actually tracking satellites and uh, providing some useful information for other people. We didn't claim to be the only ones to know about it, but we certainly were the first to say it was being used and where it was. This again was published in Flight International the following week, and again, nobody took a great deal of notice. Oh. Makes you feel as though everybody's gone deaf. Nearly a month since we found it out. Ten days since you announced it in London. Two days since it was in Flight magazine. Yes, and they certainly took their time about printing it. Not a letter, not a phone call, nothing. What are they trying to do to us? I don't know. We should have had some sort of reaction by now. Well, I would have thought so. One chap was hinting to me that maybe we've got it wrong and that the boffins are just sort of looking the other way out of politeness. No, no, look, if someone thought that they could prove us wrong, they would be on to it like a ton of... Besides, we haven't got it wrong. I oh, know. 
That's out of the question. Bit of a damp squib, then, that project of Perry's. Pity, after all that work. Horace has rather a good image. You probably know it. Of the mountains going into labour and finally giving birth to a mouse. <laughs> Nascitor ridiculus mus. Have a good Christmas, Perry. The atmosphere in the group was uh, very low at that point because we would felt here was something that we'd, we'd really achieved. At long last, we'd done something that we had done. Uh, we'd been recording information for a long, long time, for years, in fact, and we finally hit upon something that either no one else knew about or at least they hadn't told the world about. Uh, we'd found it, we were ready to tell the world about it, and then the world did seem to want to know. In Washington, D.C., unbeknown to the Kettering Group, things were beginning to move. A government scientist, Charles Sheldon, had read the article in Flight magazine. He knew its importance, but his problem was how to alert the press, given government secrecy about the space program. Charles Sheldon, for perhaps two decades, was the most authoritative source of information on the Soviet space program in the open regime, the unclassified domain. And he worked for the Library of Congress, technically speaking, although he did go on assignment to the White House. And he also worked for one of the House committees, the Committee on Science and Astronautics. So he had a very broad experience in the U.S. government dealing with space activities, but his particular interest was Soviet space. Charles Sheldon, of course, had an enormous interest in space, and, and he's setting up at the Library of Congress, and then he finds out that there is a place called Plazetsk, and he began talking about it. Why can't I print it? If the Russians have got a new launch site, presumably they know about it. So who are we keeping this from? I haven't said they've got a new site. You mean there's nothing to the story? Well, I haven't said they haven't got one either. Oh, God. I know it's a damn silly game. I don't like playing it any more than you do, but I'm just a scientific advisor. I don't make the rules. I heard a theory. That this new site could only have been discovered with the aid of some super advanced uh, technology that we don't want the Russians to know we've got. Oh boy. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you don't know how funny. <laughs> yeah. I figured that would have to be bullshit. Do you read a magazine called Flight International? I've seen copies of it. Why? Well, some interesting items in it occasionally. You didn't happen to catch a small piece about two English schoolmasters, did you? Schoolmasters? What issue would that be in? November 10th. Hey, wait a minute. Well, I read the story in Flight Magazine, and, and it, it struck me as a, a much bigger story than I'm afraid that they played it. It was a time of extreme secrecy, it was a time when the space program was building up and nobody was talking about it. So I thought the best thing I'd do would be go to the scene. And uh, I went up to Kettering. And that's it? Basically, that's it. You say it's an American model? Ex-USAF. They're still in demand, too. Mm. Well, they're practically indestructible. And the receiver I got for 25 pounds. Well, how much is that in American money? Sixty-five dollars. 
Why little Nasser reads this? <laughs> oh, listen, I've got a note that you predicted Discoverer's descent in 1963, and you got it closer than Nasser did. Well, the actual burn-up was within minutes of what we'd predicted. Oh, wow. You know, sometimes I think that NASA's inclined to be a bit too cagey. You're telling me? Once they forecast a re-entry time, plus or minus 12 hours. <laughs> That's rubbish. They must have known better than that. And the beauty part is, when the Post prints this, a lot of this information is going to have to be declassified. I mean, they can't file this as top secret. Not with you guys picking it out of the air with a Fred Flintstone kit. It means anybody can get these figures. Well, anybody can get the figures, but... Uh, Take somebody like Jeff to know what they mean. Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, listen, you guys, I'm really obliged. Thanks a lot. Then the story ran, and suddenly there's a flurry. That's the only way you can ever figure out what a secret is. Suddenly there's a flurry of activity, and you get calls. What is this Plazetska? What is Kettering? And then there, there got to be what we'd call in Washington a certain movement on the thing. I have a feeling that whatever we had up at that time in the way of surveillance satellites, and remember this was the 60s and they weren't anything near as fancy as they are now, KH-12s, that I think that they were all moved to Plazetsk in one heck of a big hurry. And the fact that Jeffrey Perry and Mr. Slater and a few lads up there could cause this kind of a flurry in the American intelligence community, I find utterly amusing and still astonishing. We were disappointed by the lack of reaction from the technical press and elsewhere. But here was a newspaper, an American newspaper. The balloon really had gone up. Gee. Well, I'll tell him you're here. Daily Express, you said, but actually he's... Oh, excuse me. Um, the thing is, the BBC television people are coming at 10.30 and another lot from London. Excuse me. Excuse me. Could you ring back in ten minutes and he'll talk to you himself? Mike? What? You've got to be ready by 10.30. Wear your school uniform. Get hold of some of the others. All right. Excuse me. Gee, you... Gee? Yes? You must come and talk to them. And gee... What? Don't say yes to any television before 10 o'clock. You must get your hair cut. Message received and understood. The day we after we broke up for the Christmas holiday, the whole of the world's media descended upon Kettering. We had over 60 phone calls, five TV crews, they got me out of the barber's chair, out of the bath, they stopped me playing golf. We were quite unprepared for the fuss and uh, publicity that we gained from this. We had film crews and cameramen and reporters uh, flocking into the, uh, into the labs. I'd never experienced anything like it, and to be what was basically a national hero, if you like, to be on national television, uh, in, in a little sleepy town like Kettering at the time, I was walking around the streets thinking everybody in Kettering must have seen me on the television last night. I was so excited that it upset my stomach. I had nothing alcoholic at Grandma's over Christmas, and I've been teetotal ever since. Perry's discovery in 1966 made him a respected figure in the American space community. He became a consultant to the U.S. Library of Congress. In England, he remained a schoolteacher. He carried on tracking the Soviets in space with pupils at Kettering until his early retirement in 1984. The school has not continued his space program. He's a remarkable man, Jeffrey Perry. I think uh, an unsung hero in his own country. They weren't looking for kudos, they weren't looking for anything except why the thing was going by when it went. And he took these lads and got them expert in time separation, orbits, 
perigees, apogees, things that they'd never heard about before, and he ended up finding Plisetsk, to the astonishment of the world and its spooks. Wherever I go in the States, whatever space group I'm talking to, they've heard of Jeff Perry and the Kettering Group and about the boys that he taught in physics and all of that. And when I come here, he's really not as well known as he is in a country that's 3,000 miles away. It's very curious. I've never understood why Jeffrey Perry hasn't got more recognition in his own country from the scientific community or the educational community for that matter. He is very, very well known in both those bodies in this country, but not in the United Kingdom. And I just will never understand it. Hi all, welcome to Sky for the Month for October 2021. I guess we're all hoping that uh, this will be the last one done by YouTube and that from now on we'll actually get to do them in person. There were quite a lot of highlights for October, November 2021. We have four comets and a couple of meteor showers in addition to a few other things. So moving right along, have Comet uh, Cherimov Gerasimenko, half a degree northeast of M35 in Gemini. Way of finding that would be to put M35 into your go to and let the scope do the hard work for you. We have the Orion's Meteor Shower from the 2nd of the 10th to the 7th of the 11th, and it peaks around the 21st of the 10th with around about uh, 20 meteors per hour. So uh, it should be quite a, a specky one. Mercury will be at maximum elongation west, uh, thus a morning object on the 25th, although it's not expected to be all that uh, good to observe. Comet Fay will be in Gemini. Uh, it is unfortunately an AM object, so uh, definitely for the night owls. Last quarter moon occurring on the 29th of the 10th. Comet DRST uh, in uh, Microscopium near NG6925. Once again, dial that into your go-to scope and uh, let it do the work for you. Venus, uh, shining very brightly there in our western uh, sky, is at uh, maximum elongation uh, east on the 30th. By, uh, by maximum elongation east indicates it is a evening object. We have uh, Comet uh, Borelli half a degree northeast of Zeta Grus and it is a PM object and uh, hopefully reasonably easy to find. Comet Tuttle should even be easier 
Uh, it's near NGC 4373, which is a galaxy in Centaurus, which is uh, over there near the Southern Cross. In the next month, on the 4th of the 11th, Uranus will be at opposition. Uh, obviously, as an outer planet, this is the best time to, uh, to view it. One of the advantages of Uranus being slightly uh, closer and uh, minutely larger than uh, Neptune, it uh, hopefully is a reasonably easy object for people to find even without a go-to scope. Certainly uh, a good one to have a crack at. 5th of the 11th we have a new moon, so a uh, good opportunity to find Uranus. On the 9th of the 11th, uh, Comet Chermov Gerasimenko will be 1.5 degrees south of Pollux, Pollux being one of the twin stars in Gemini, and uh, they are also quite easy to find. Comet Tuttle, 1.5 uh, degree northeast of Omega Centauri on the 18th, should be uh, also an easy one to, uh, to have a shot at. And unfortunately on the 19th of the 11th, for those who are looking to have a, a go at these comets, we do have a full moon. With respect to the October night sky looking to the south, uh, those who've uh, followed this series for a while now will notice that everything seems to move slightly to the west uh, each month, with the exception of the things around the South Celestial Pole, which seem to move around that point in a clockwise direction. At the moment, uh, 47 Tucane is a globular cluster, probably second only to Omega Centauri uh, itself, just there slightly above the South Celestial Pole. It's actually quite easy to find in a, a finder scope and, uh, and put even a, a non-go-to scope uh, onto it, right next to the uh, small Magellanic Cloud. The uh, Tarantula Nebula uh, is actually in the large Magellanic Cloud and is probably more one for the uh, astrophotographers to get. It's, uh, it's not the, the greatest to view through a telescope. Looking over there to the left, uh, many of you will note that uh, Orion is now starting to breach the eastern horizon and so for the next few months uh, it should rise even further allowing us to have a good view of the uh, Orion Nebula. As for the October sky looking to the north a couple of things are worth noting here at the moment particularly for those who uh, have a reasonably light free view of the north. Uh, I think most of us would have to go uh, up north of Melbourne into regional Victoria, so uh, put your sneaking shoes on at the moment. Things of note there, the Great Square of Pegasus uh, makes it fairly e easy to uh, spot the uh, constellation of Pegasus and you'll note there at the head you have a globular cluster M15, so uh, worth chasing down. A little bit closer to the horizon uh, and certainly spectacular if you can actually get a good view on it and that is M31 which is the Andromeda Galaxy uh, is a large spiral galaxy uh, fairly close to our own galaxy and uh, by all accounts uh, fairly visible if you can get a nice dark sky view Planets for this month, uh, Mercury has moved through its inferior conjunction uh, on the 10th of this month, basically meaning it's between Earth and uh, the Sun, so really not much uh, hope of viewing it at the moment. It will reappear in the morning sky, uh, ultimately reaching its maximum elongation on the 25th of the 10th. Unfortunately, it's expected to remain fairly low on the dawn horizon, so uh, shouldn't uh, or probably won't be all that good to look at. Venus, uh, very obvious in our western evening sky in Scorpio, uh, has a close encounter with Antares, the uh, brightest star in Scorpio on the 16th to the 10th, and it reaches its maximum elongation on the 30th, uh, after which it will slowly get closer to the horizon uh, as it heads, heads towards its inferior conjunction. Not much to report for Earth. Uh, other than uh, with spring and daylight saving, our observing times have got a little bit later. Uh, looking at all the outer planets, Mars could not be in a worse position to uh, view at the moment. 
it moves into conjunction with the sun on the 8th of the 10th, so it has actually uh, gone through its uh, conjunction, and that won't reappear until late November in the early morning uh, eastern sky. Jupiter and Saturn, on the other hand, are both in ideal viewing positions at the moment. They've passed their opposition, so they're not quite straight up. Makes it a little bit easier to put a telescope on it, and certainly easier on the necks and knees of uh, those of us who are age-challenged. Little note with Saturn, uh, on the 30th of the 10th, it reaches a point in its orbit known as its eastern quadrature. Now, this is a, a point where uh, a line from Saturn to the Sun, from the Sun to Earth, is, uh, forms a 90 degree uh, angle. So it uh, is apparently a good time to uh, view Saturn's, or the shadow of the ring on Saturn. Uranus, still in Aries, till 2025 I believe. Uh, rising now just after sunset in the eastern sky. Uh, it is a good object uh, to have a bit of a crack at. It's around about 5th to 6th magnitude. So it's not quite visible to the naked eye, but slightly easier to, uh, to find with a telescope. You just uh, need to be able to have a bit of an idea where to look. Uh, it will reach opposition, uh, the best time for viewing it, if, you, if there is such a thing, on the 4th of the 11th. Uh, Neptune, still in Aquarius. Uh, it's a challenge to get without a go-to scope. It's uh, still worth having a go for the uh, for the more enthusiastic. See if you can find it. It uh, doesn't appear very big, but it uh, does have a very distinct uh, blue appearance if you uh, if you actually find it. Looking at the appearance of the planets, uh, Mercury. Uh, as it's gone through inferior conjunction, has its uh, unlit rear end to us, and so we see it mostly as uh, black or at best a uh, very faint crescent. As it moves to its uh, greatest elongation west, you'll notice that uh, it's about half lit. Venus, on the other hand, moving to greatest elongation uh, east, is also half lit, and if you particularly observe it, you'll notice on the opposite side of, uh, of the disk to what Mercury is. Mars, I uh, don't know why they even bother to put a picture of Mars there at the moment. Uh, it is on the other side of the Sun. I guess if you could blot out the Sun and see it, you would see the full face of it. It is, however, rather small and a long, long way away, so don't expect to see any detail. Saturn and uh, Jupiter, as I said, are in a very good position to be viewed this month. Uh, not very far away from each other. Saturn just slightly further west than what Jupiter is. As uh, Saturn reaches its quadrature, you can check out the shadow of the rings on the uh, disk. And with Jupiter, as always, you're looking at its four moons, its bands, and the red spot. Uranus, uh, heading towards uh, opposition, so uh, in the best position for viewing. There's not a lot of features on Uranus, and so it doesn't appear as much more than a, a blue-green dot, but it is quite distinctly a planet. Neptune, on the other hand, is uh, really, through any of my telescopes, much more than just a blue dot, but you can tell it is a distinctly blue. Quite a bit of stuff, uh, other stuff for this month, so I've actually had to go on to another screen for the uh, meteor showers. As for the comets, we have Comet de Arrest, uh, currently in Sagittarius, uh, which puts it in the evening sky. Uh, although heading towards the uh, western horizon. And uh, for most of the month it can be found within the teapot asterism, which is the central part of Sagittarius, the way which uh, most of us find Sagittarius. If you're not really sure about it, get one of the more experienced astronomers uh, at the Society to point it out to you. Once you've seen it, you'll never forget it. And then you can have a bit of a hunt for the uh, comet in amongst it. It is a uh, galactic centre, so there is quite a bit uh, behind it. So picking out a comet, good luck. Uh, it is expected to fade also from 10th magnitude to 11th magnitude, so telescope is a must. Comet Tuttle, uh, it moves into Centaurus, uh, so easy one to find. 
most of us know where uh, Centaurus is. Uh, but he's there on the 24th of the 10th. But it is also expected to fade from 10th to 11th magnitude. So maybe a little bit close to the horizon and uh, difficult to find. Comet Fay, uh, currently rising about midnight. So not too bad. Uh, beginning the month in Orion, then moving into Gemini and ultimately Monoceros. It'll remain around about 10th magnitude, but it's definitely one for those who uh, don't mind missing out on sleep. And the last one, Comet uh, cherimov gerasimenko uh, It begins the month in Taurus and moves into Gemini mid-month. It should be around about 9th magnitude, so <laughs> marginally easier to find than the other ones. And it's there for the whole month, but it's also one for the uh, early morning uh, enthusiasts. Continuing with the other stuff, uh, we have two meteor showers to look out for at the moment. We have the southern torrids, uh, will be active or have been active from the, uh, September through to the 20th of the 11th. And uh, they peaked around about the 10th of the 10th. They uh, should still be uh, putting up a few uh, to view. They're known for being bright, slow-moving fireballs uh, with the occasional colourful one. And they're associated with Comet Enki. The other shower is the Orionids, and uh, they're best from the late evening till dawn. Have an activity peak of around about 20 meteors an hour, around the 21st, 22nd of October. And they're associated with uh, Halley's Comet. And uh, apparently for the last 20 years, they've been fairly, uh, fairly easy to spot. So perhaps one, uh, one to chase after. And that concludes Sky for the Month for the month of October 2021. Thank you for joining me and I hope the information I've provided tonight is, uh, will be helpful for your viewing endeavours. The information was provided courtesy of Astronomy 2021 by Wallace Dawes of Northfield. And I remind MPAS members that Astronomy 2022 uh, is available, although in limited numbers. Uh, if you haven't already ordered it, there may be a couple of copies still available uh, at the MPAS site uh, at the front counter. Thank you. Hope to see you all next month in person. Right now, the Earth's surface is spinning at several hundred meters per second, and we're all along for the ride. It doesn't actually feel like you're moving, though, which is nice, because being super dizzy all the time doesn't sound like a fun way to live. But that also means that for a long time we didn't know for sure that the Earth was spinning at all. People have suspected the Earth rotates for thousands of years, but it wasn't like they could just go to space and see for themselves, so it was hard to prove in a simple, clear way. Until 1851, when French physicist Léon Foucault hung a pendulum from one of the highest ceilings in Paris and let it swing. Before this, some astronomers as far back as the ancient Greeks thought the Earth rotated because that would explain why the Sun and other stars move across the sky. But not everyone accepted that. Most people believed that stars were attached to some kind of celestial sphere that spun around us, and it probably didn't help that some of the ideas about what caused the Earth to rotate were a bit odd. Take Philolos of Croton. About 2300 years ago, he suggested the Earth rotated because it had a twin planet that no one in Greece ever saw. Supposedly, Earth and this mysterious counter-Earth spun around each other, always facing opposite directions, at least from the Greeks' perspective. Even back then, it wasn't exactly a popular idea. Over the next few thousand years, astronomers in Europe, India, and the Middle East also looked at the moving stars and suggested the Earth rotated, but none of them could prove it. Finally, in 1651, an Italian physicist named Giovanni Battista Riccioli had an idea. He wrote that if the Earth rotated, a cannonball shot due north should curve to the right. It sounds like a weird way to explain the Earth's rotation, but Riccioli was on the right track. If you did fire a cannonball north, it would curve to the right, because of what we now call the Coriolis effect 
although it wasn't named that until 200 years later. The Coriolis effect says that something moving in the northern hemisphere will look like it's being pushed to the right, and something moving in the southern hemisphere will look like it's being pushed to the left. Part of the reason for the Coriolis effect comes from the fact that the closer you get to the equator, the faster the Earth's surface rotates. That's because the planet is widest at the equator, so you have to travel farther to get all the way around it than you do closer to the poles. But it takes one day for the Earth to finish one rotation no matter where you are which means the surface closer to the equator has to travel farther in the same amount of time, so it moves faster. Say you're standing at the equator and fire a cannonball north. The ball zooms north, but at the same time it's still moving east with the speed of the Earth's rotation at the equator where it left the cannon. That means that as it moves north, it's moving east faster than the Earth's surface. From your perspective standing next to the cannon, it looks like it's moving to the right. Unfortunately, or maybe luckily, physicists at the time didn't have much access to cannons. Besides, it would be tough to track the path of the cannonball and see if it curved or not. So scientists decided to try something easier. They dropped balls off the top of the tallest towers they could find. The top of the tower would be moving faster than the bottom for the same reason that the Earth's surface of the equator moves faster than it does near the poles. To rotate once, the top of the tower has to travel in a bigger circle. So if the Earth didn't rotate, the balls should drop straight down. But if it did, the balls should land off to the side because the top of the tower is spinning faster than the ground. One physicist, Giovanni Battista Guglielmini, found that if you dropped a ball off a tower about 74 meters tall, it would land around a centimeter to the side. It was just a small difference, and it was hard to know if the measurements were accurate, but it was encouraging evidence that the Earth rotated. Now, by the mid-1800s, most people did believe the Earth rotated because they'd finally accepted that Earth orbits the Sun. A rotating Earth was the best explanation for why the Sun and stars move across the sky, and they had some evidence for it, like from watching how the stars moved relative to each other. But it was still hard to prove in a clear, easy to see way, until Leon Foucault. In 1851, Foucault found a proof that could easily be repeated and didn't require any tall towers. He hung a pendulum from a string and let it swing. Since the pendulum is just hanging from the ceiling on a string, Earth's rotation can't force it to swivel. The ceiling it's attached to is rotating, but the string stays put while the ceiling turns around it. So once Foucault started the pendulum swinging, it just kept moving back and forth, but in the meantime, Earth kept rotating underneath it. From the perspective of someone standing on the ground, it looked like the pendulum swing was turning clockwise. That was the Coriolis effect in action. The pendulum swing didn't turn by much, but as time passed and the Earth kept rotating, its orientation changed more and more. Foucault first tested his pendulum in his basement and then in the Paris Observatory for fellow scientists, and it worked. Then he hung a 67-meter pendulum from the dome of Paris's Pantheon, a mausoleum for the greatest French thinkers, and showed it off to the public. For the first time, people could see a simple demonstration of Earth's rotation with their own eyes. Still, watching a swinging pendulum isn't something you want to do for hours, so to help them out, Foucault placed the pendulum over a bed of sand. As the pendulum swung, the tip traced out a line in the sand, and over time, the line showed the pendulum was no longer swinging in the same direction. You can find Foucault's pendulums in science museums all over the world, and even though they might seem like just a cool party trick now that we can see Earth rotating from space, they were really important for helping us understand how our planet works. The only people who weren't excited about Foucault's discovery were the scientific elite, who were annoyed by his lack of traditional scientific training. Unfortunately for them, that didn't change the fact that Foucault created the first simple, clear proof that the Earth rotated. But maybe they were just mad that they didn't think of it first. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow. If you'd like to learn more about the Coriolis effect, you can watch our episode about how it might not mean what you think it means. A uh, Foucault pendulum is a pendulum with a specially designed pivot, designed so that it can swing back and forth in any direction around the vertical. So that's in contrast to, for example, a grandfather clock, where the pendulum has to swing in a particular plane. Let's imagine that you have a Foucault pendulum and you're at the north pole of the Earth. When you set the pendulum swinging, you determine a plane in which the pendulum is swinging. And that plane is fixed. So as the Earth rotates, the Earth rotates underneath the plane of the pendulum swinging. And so if you now go back and imagine that you're standing on the Earth, you see the plane of the pendulum 
rotate every 24 hours. Now, as you go to lower latitudes away from the North Pole, the time that it takes the pendulum, the plane of the pendulum to rotate around lengthens. And in fact, at the equator, the plane doesn't rotate at all. At the latitude of Hanover, it takes 35 hours for the plane to rotate. So if you look at this pendulum here, if we look at it a few minutes from now, we won't even be able to detect that the plane of the pendulum swing has changed. But if you come back in an hour, uh, you will definitely see that it's moved a little bit. And if you come back in nine hours, this plane of this pendulum here will have rotated by 90 degrees, a very distinct change that you can easily see. The plane of the pendulum swing is also affected, for example, by the revolution of the Earth around the Sun. And so, for example, if you have a, a Foucault pendulum at the North Pole of the Earth, not only will it rotate around every day because the Earth is rotating, but you will also get a much longer rotation over the period of a year uh, from the revolution of the Earth around the Sun. So if you think about it, this Foucault pendulum here is a kind of rotation meter. It's a way of measuring rotations. A suitably placed, uh, Foucault, a suitably placed Foucault pendulum can be used to detect the rotation of the Earth or the, rotation of the revolution of the Earth around the Sun. Or, in principle, you could use a suitably oriented Foucault, Foucault pendulum to measure the rotation, for example, of the, of the solar system around the galaxy. So this brings up the question, the Foucault pendulum is sensitive to rotation, but rotation around what? And there's been a lot of speculation in physics and philosophy about that question. Ernst Mach, a 19th century and 20th century physicist, put forward the conjecture that the Foucault pendulum is measuring rotation relative to the universe as a whole makes a kind of interesting connection between a local physics experiment here in this room and the universe as a whole. And the problem that people bring up is, you know, how can this pendulum here somehow know something about the entire universe? So it remains as an unproven conjecture, more in the realm of philosophy than in physics at this point.
I'm just so excited for this trip because not only are we going to be actually using the telescopes, you know, doing some observations, making up for that lost time back in January when the telescopes froze shut because of a freak snowstorm, but we're also actually going to La Palma. Like it feels real now because I've just booked all my flights, I've booked my accommodation at the top of the mountain and I'm just, this is the first trip like post pandemic, right? Like I'm so excited. A volcano erupts on the Canary Islands. The army is called in as thousands are evacuated. And here's the molten lava that's on the move. A slow motion menace inching relentlessly downhill. This is a live geology lesson in nature's unstoppable forces. And it's not just property. Just had the email through. The observatory shut and they've advised us not to travel. I kind of saw this coming. Still sad about it though. Now, obviously the eruption on the Palma is horrendous for all of those who are directly affected. I feel so much for those who've either lost their homes or have been forced to evacuate their homes or have lost their livelihoods because of this eruption, the first in 50 odd years. The first since the observatory was built on top of the mountain. And I know not being able to observe with a telescope is the least of everyone's concerns here in this whole catastrophe that's happened. However, I thought that some of you might be curious as to why volcanic ash specifically is such a big deal and is such an issue for astronomical observations and also for the observatory itself. Now, obviously any volcanic eruption where you have lava flow, if the observatory was in the way, that would be a huge deal. Now, thankfully the eruption was actually on the younger southern half of the island, whereas the observatory is on the northern, older, more stable part of the island. So when the eruption first went off on Sunday the 19th of September, the observatory at the top of the mountain in La Palma, the Roque de los Muchachos observatory, it just wasn't affected at all and that's because it was far enough away from any lava flows and there was a northeasterly wind that meant that any volcanic ash was taken away from the island and it didn't come anywhere near the observatory then by the 23rd of september the wind had changed and volcanic ash had been brought over to the observatory now thankfully that night it was cloudy so the telescope domes were shut which protected them from any of the ash but it was very clear when the support astronomers arrived at the observatory in the morning to do the maintenance work that the telescope domes that usually are shut to protect all of the um, telescope from the elements were covered in a very fine layer of volcanic ash and this is the issue. You do not want volcanic ash going anywhere near your million quid telescope. So the first issue is moving parts being affected by volcanic ash. So volcanic ash is not soft and fluffy like the ash you get off a fire you might light in your house, right? You know, when the kindling sometimes poofs off this little floofer that floats away in the air, right? Volcanic ash is really rough and abrasive. So if that gets into any moving parts, it can be really damaging. And there's a lot of moving parts on telescopes. The domes themselves will move around on a track with the actual telescope as it looks in different parts of the sky, because you've got that little slit that the telescope sort of looks out of. Again, that's to help protect it from the elements. Obviously, the telescope itself moves because it drives to look at a certain position, a certain coordinate in the sky. So if any ash got into those moving parts, that would be incredibly damaging. The second issue is ash in your electronics. Although the telescope that we were planning to use, the Isaac Newton telescope, was built in the 1970s, it has obviously since then been updated with all of your mod cons. Everything's driven by computers. I could even type a command here in Oxford into the computer and the telescope would move in the palm. It can all be operated remotely. But what that means is that there's then a lot of electronics that are susceptible to damage from volcanic ash. So for example, if ash got into a vent, if it blocked a vent or it jammed a cooling fan on some electronics, that would be incredibly damaging because then they would overheat. Lots and lots of monetary damage that all your parts need new replacing. Then, of course, you've got the issue of ash shorting out electronic circuits. So ash is rocky. It will have little bits of metal in it. And so it can short out circuits again, causing lots and lots of damage. Then you've got even things like keyboards, right? Keyboards have all these holes in them that the ash can get into. And they're incredibly susceptible to that as well. So ash in your electronics is not something you want. The third issue, and probably the biggest here, is that volcanic ash massively affects the observations you can take 
and specifically how good those observations are. So most astronomical observatories are built away from light pollution and usually high up a mountain. So yes, that's the Canary Islands, but also the Atacama Desert in Chile, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, the middle of the outback in Australia, and also in South Africa as well. They're great locations because the air is thinner the higher you go, which means you're looking through less atmosphere. Less atmosphere means less water vapor. It means less turbulence in the atmosphere as well. Think about when you get on a plane and you experience turbulence. That's pockets of air that are different temperatures or pressures that shake about the airplane. Imagine what that does to light as it comes through the atmosphere as well. So think about like what causes stars to twinkle, right? Twinkle, twinkle, little star is caused by the atmosphere. It's caused by variations in the atmosphere. And it means that your image moves around. It ends up being really fuzzy. So rather hilariously, twinkle, twinkle, little star is kind of an astronomer's nightmare. It's more like twinkle, twinkle, little star, how annoying you are. <laughs> So we do have ways of removing a lot of this normal disturbance that you will get in the atmosphere. It's what's called adapted optics. If you've ever seen a laser firing out of the top of a telescope, what it's doing is recording how the tiny point of the laser beam is changed as it goes through the atmosphere. And then it adapts the mirror that's collecting all that light. It actually deforms it so that when the light reflects off it, it will focus on the telescope as a perfect point of light and remove all of that atmospheric turbulence. So obviously that can be used to correct for normal atmospheric conditions like different pressures, different temperatures, maybe even high humidity. But if you've chucked a load of particles into the atmosphere, whether that is clumps of volcanic ash or maybe even something like a, like a dust storm as well, like think about like sand in the air, then any light that's coming in from a star or a galaxy through the atmosphere is essentially going to end up taking a path that resembles more like a pinball machine, right? It's just going to ping from particle to particle, again, getting completely disrupted on its way down to you. And you're going to end up with the fuzziest image ever. So even if by some miracle the ash lifts up higher into the atmosphere and it's no longer an issue on the roads, making driving dangerous up to the mountain, and it's not no longer like collecting on the dome, so it's going to be an issue to the electronics or any of the moving parts, even if it lifts and it's still higher in the atmosphere, there's still no point in opening because you're not going to get the high quality observations that you need to do the science you want to do. And so that's the position we're sort of in now is that we're really hoping for the best. We're saying, OK, we can't travel to the observatory. Fine. You know, there is an emergency going on the island and we're going to respect that. And it's not safe for us to travel and it's not safe for us to be there when we get there either. So what I'm really hoping for now is that maybe by like Friday, we have some good news that the eruption has slowed and maybe the wind direction has changed and, and takes all of that ash away from the observatory and that we can actually open, you know, with the support astronomer who'll be on the mountain and, and us sort of switching to nights working from home over the weekend as well. I've got all my fingers and toes crossed that that actually happens. And if it does, then next week's video will be a vlog of what we actually observed and, and how that observing went. So yeah, fingers crossed. If you want an update, you know, this is getting posted on Thursday, a couple of days later. So if you want an update of whether that actually did happen, keep an eye on my Twitter and Instagram and I'll let you know if we did actually manage to open and if we did get some, some good news or not. Fingers crossed, everyone, because you know what? After the 18 months that we've had, like, and the fact that we had time in January on the same telescope to do the same thing, but there was a freak snowstorm that hit, you know, which was the craziest of thing. You know, Madrid hadn't had snow in however many years. The Palmer hadn't seen it. The telescope door was all froze shut. So that was weather and that meant, oh, okay, never mind. You don't get your time back. You just have to apply again. And we thought, let's apply for September because it'll be a safer bet than January in terms of weather. And now this has happened. All I want for my PhD student right now is just some data. And I really hope we get it. This isn't really a blooper. It's just something funny I found while editing this video. So it's now Wednesday afternoon and We've already heard from the observatory that we're not opening tonight, which should have been our first night observing, so fine. So after we heard that from them, I was like, I wonder how long volcanic eruptions in the Palmer have lasted in the past, and if that'll give us an idea about whether I should get hopeful for opening. And I found this paper from 2010 um, that looks at the risk of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions to a lot of the major observatories in Hawaii and La Palma 
and Chile. And in that paper, it said that La Palma eruptions on average in the past have lasted anywhere from 24 to 84 days. So now I'm really not that hopeful at all that will open. Um, but I did enjoy the last sentence of this abstract, which says, the lowest geological hazard in both seismic and volcanic activity is found at Roque de la Muchachos Observatory on the island of La Palma. That was written in 2010. It didn't age well, did it? So with that, uh, we'll uh, come to the end of the October 2021 meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical uh, Society. And uh, what we'll show now is uh, a time-lapse image of the night sky um, taken by the very large uh, telescope, the VLT in uh, Chile, in um, the uh, European Southern Observatory. So they see the uh, sky oriented round the same orientation that we do in Australia. Um, in other words, uh, the right way up. Uh, and uh, that will be um, with uh, background music uh, called All Paths Possible by uh, William Worworth as well. So uh, enjoy and uh, we'll see you all at uh, November's meeting, hopefully uh, face to face.